Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie, host and head bookologist here at the Get Literate Podcast. I'm a book-loving, notebook-hoarding reader and writer on a mission to change lives one book and one notebook at a time. On this podcast, we explore the power of bookology and leading literate lives. We talk all things books and reading and notebooks and writing mixed in with mindful practices and creativity to create lives we love. You can expect regular weekly episodes focused on three books you need to know about on a bookish theme and how to bring those themes to life in our actual lives too. You can also expect author interviews, notebooking inspiration, and topics to help us grow through what we go through and take inspired action to make our lives better. So grab a notebook and your TBR list and let's get literate. everyone. Welcome back to the Get Literate Podcast. I'm Stephanie, your host, here with a book collection about friendship. So why am I talking about friendship and why right now? Well, if you don't know this, I have this really fun thing that I do at least once, but lately three or four times a week, which is I send bookish snail mail out into the world. I have these really wonderful postcards that look like the old fashioned library cards. And on them, there is a place to recommend a particular book for a particular person. On the library card, I list the author and the title of the book. And then I have a space to share why I think the book is perfect for you. So I have this Google form. And if you go onto my website at alitlife.com and you click free literate love, and then you scroll down to the bookish snail mail, you can just open up that Google form, tell me your name, your physical snail mail address, and answer a question or two or three about your reading life. And from there, I pull what I think is a perfect book for you right now, and then I send it off to you in snail mail. There's nothing better than getting mail, except getting book mail. And even though this isn't a book, It is just a wonderful thing to have a book personally recommended to you. And I've loved meeting so many people that I wouldn't have otherwise met in this way. I even have my own Google map so that I can drop a pin into every city that I've sent postcards to recently. And I just love watching that map grow. One recent submission requested a book around adult friendships. This particular reader felt like she had lost touch with her friends lately. Her business life, her work life, her life life was just very, very busy and felt like it was taking over. And she wanted to get back to her actual friends. And she joked that even if these weren't her actual friends, she wanted to feel like she had some fictional friends to balance out the busyness of her life. And I could totally relate to this, right? Because the fictional characters we read about in our books, they become friends. At least they become friends to me. It reminds me of this beautiful picture book. If you haven't seen this book, you need to go out and get it. It's called Books Make Good Friends by Jane Pound. Do you know this book? It is beautiful. It's about this little girl who has trouble making friends at school. She'd much rather sit on the blacktop at the playground and read her book. She does things with her family, like have family dinners and go on hikes, but she would much rather read books in those locations than do the things of of living, which, you know, I could completely relate to. Uh, But then mom, mom shows her on their hike some books about hiking that might bring her some enthusiasm for actually doing the thing, and they do. And then she realizes that books could be friends, but they could also be tools to make real friends in real life. Oh, it's just such a wonderful book. It's such a wonderful philosophy. It matches what I believe and what I talk about here on the Get Literate podcast. So if you don't know that book, that's Books Make Great Friends by Jane Pound. But anyway, back to the request that was sent to me in snail mail. Her request really hit home. 
I felt like she was talking to me directly because that's how I often feel. Adult friendships are hard, right? When you're a kid, when you're a teenager, even when you're a young adult, you just have more time. Now, I know you don't actually have more time, but it feels like you have more time because there are less things that are vying for your attention. We often don't have jobs that are as busy as they are later in life. We don't often have children at that early time. And so as we grow, there are just so many other things. And yes, they are wonderful things, but it can be easy to let those friendships go. At least it's definitely easy for me. And I know I'm not alone though, because in October of 2023, the Pew Research Center put out a study uh, or a survey, if you will, about friendship. And they said, at least from the people that answered, that 61% of adults they surveyed did believe that close friends were essential to a fulfilled life. So over half adults agree, friendship is so important. But then when you looked at the actual friendship statistics, 53% of adults had at least one close friend. So between one and four close friends that they felt were strong friendships. 38% felt like they had five or more friendships, but there was almost 10% of the population that said, I don't have a single person that I could consider a close friend. And that really is part of the loneliness epidemic that is talked about more and more lately. If you've read All the Lonely People by Mike Gale, then you can definitely visualize what what I'm talking about. I'm not going to talk about that book today because I've talked about it in previous episodes. But if you want a book on friendship, All the Lonely People by Mike Gale is definitely a place that I think you need to start. But it just was kind of striking to me that we all know that friendships are important, but not all of us are able to bring them into our lives the way we want to. And because of bookish serendipity, I was listening to some other podcasts and I was listening to Mel Robbins. And of course, I forget the doctor's name right now, Um, but he was here talking about Harvard's longest study on happiness. It was an 80 something year old study in the making, and they wanted to figure out what made people happy. How could some people with what seemed like wonderful backgrounds ripe for happiness be happy and others not? And how could some people from backgrounds that maybe were less likely to produce happiness because they weren't getting their basic needs met, how were they becoming happy? So there were so many really neat questions around this study and the results, there were a lot of results, but essentially this researcher was saying it really boils down to one thing. What was the number one thing? that people who are happy had in common. And it wasn't what I thought. I really didn't see this one coming. And here it is. The number one predictor or influencer of happiness was how strong our relationships were with other people. Friendships, family, the relationship with others was the number one one predictor, right? You were in a community, you felt seen, you felt heard, you had people that you could rely on to help you through a troubling time. You could help someone through a troubling time. The happiness of these people's lives could be best measured in the quality of their relationships. And it reminded me about all of the studies about the blue zones, right? There's the Blue Zone books, but maybe you've watched the Netflix series as well. All of the research around the Blue Zones, and there are a lot of things that contribute to a long, healthy life in the Blue Zones, people who are living happily and healthily into their hundreds. Uh, But one of the most consistent pieces was relationships with others and feeling like you were part of a community. And you know my favorite quote, I've said it often from Jim Rohn, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. 
right? So if relationships are a huge predictor of our happiness, then we have to choose who we spend our time with. And that means first, we have to choose to spend time with other people, right? No matter how busy life gets, we have to make time for ourselves to build those friendships. And so the request in the bookish snail mail just really got me thinking. And of course, I feel like books can help us think about anything, but they can especially help us think about friendship. They can think about, or they can help us think about how to cultivate it, how to imagine what a friend-filled life could look like, the changes we might make into their own life, the kind of relationships we want to have. Those fictional friendships can teach us a thing or two about actual friendships. And as I sat there wondering which book I was going to recommend to her, I instantly had a bunch of books come to mind. Right? Now, I'm not going to talk about these books in particular. I have I have three books I want to share with you today, but I wanted them to be books that I had never talked about on the podcast before. But I have to say, if you haven't read these books that I'm about to list to you, I think you need to go find them just because they're amazing books, but especially if you want to bring more adult friendships or at least the idea of adult friendships into your life. Now, I already mentioned Mike Gale's All the Lonely People such a beautiful book about friendship. You know that I love The Authenticity Project by Claire Pooley. This is the one where the first character sets off a chain of friendship by telling his honest story in a notebook and then leaving that notebook in a very popular, busy coffee shop for someone to find, to read, and to add their own story. And these people just end up coming together in the most beautiful ways. Firefly Lane by Kristen Hanna, how I loved this trilogy. Now, you might be thinking of the Netflix movie, and that's great because the Netflix, actually, it wasn't a movie. It was a Netflix series. It was wonderful, but it wasn't the same as the book, and that really annoyed me because I wanted to see the book come to life. Either way, it was great, but I adored these books between these two amazing friends. The Keeper of Lost Things by Ruth Hogan. I would say that's a book about some unlikely friendships, both close ones and tangen tangential, is that how I say it? Um, less close friendships based on reuniting people with objects they have lost. It's a beautiful, beautiful story. Now, Ellery Adams has this wonderful cozy read. It's a cozy murder mystery. Um, the Secret Book and Scone Society. So not the secret book and scone society, but secret comma book comma. <laughs> so there's three things. There's secrets, there's books, and there's scones. And they're really cool scones that are baked just for you and your personality, along with the book that is chosen just for you and your personality. And the unlikely friendship of women who come together in this town to solve the cozy murder. Well, the murder is not cozy, but the story is. And then if you haven't read Vicki Zimmerman's Miss Cecily's Recipes for Exceptional Ladies, oh, this is a fun one. This is about a woman who ends up volunteering in a nursing home and befriends Miss Cecily, who has some secrets of her own, but works really hard to pass along some life tidbits, some wisdom to the main character, and they become very fast and unlikely and wonderful friends. And there are recipes, of course, in that book. So if you haven't read any of those friendship books, put them on your TBR. Let me list them one more time. Mike Gale's All the Lonely People, The Authenticity Project by Claire Pooley, The Firefly Lane Trilogy by Kristen Hanna, Keeper of Lost Things by Ruth Hogan, Secret, The Secret, comma, Book, and Scone Society by Ellery Adams, and Miss Cecily's Recipes for Exceptional Ladies by Vicki Zimmerman. Those are books that instantly come to my mind as books to cultivate a spirit of friendship. But as I mentioned, I wanted to talk about three books today that I haven't mentioned on the podcast yet. I wanted to bring you something new and hopefully something that you hadn't heard of. The first book I want to recommend is a nonfiction book, personal development book 
on the topic of friendship. So I would say this one you probably have heard about because Laura Tremaine is quite popular and quite wonderful. And The Life Council, the book I'm talking about, is a hit with many people and many book clubs. So the full title is called The Life Council, 10 Friends Every Woman Needs. This book gave me a really interesting way to think about friendship and especially adult friendship. She starts off with her five friendship philosophies about what it means to be a friend, which is just a, a really, it was a really neat way to open up the book and think about, well, what are my friendship philosophies and what do I believe about friendship and what kind of friend am I and what kind of friend do I want to be and all of those things. She gives us so much to think about in terms of our own life and our own friendship philosophies right from the start. And essentially the book is centered around the idea of building a life council for yourself. So thinking about your adult friendships as a life council, basically a set of friends who will fulfill various roles in your life, right? Because every friend can't be that super close best friend, but that doesn't mean that they aren't important. So in the Life Council, she talks about these friends. And I loved thinking about friends like this. No, I don't want to separate friends into categories. But certain friends come into your life for certain reasons. And that's what I liked thinking about. So she talks about the daily duty friend, right? The one that you talk to every day. The old friend. The business bestie. The fellow obsessive. Someone who loves what you love the battle buddy, the one you can count on in a hard time, the yes friend, right? The one who's always up for saying yes to you, the mentor, the password protector, the one that you feel close with, with some of those innermost secrets, the empty chair for friends that are no longer with us, whether that is because they have passed away or that friendship has just taken a different turn, but you're still honoring them the new friend, and then the one I think people think of when we think of friends, which is the soul sister. So friends are different, and adult friendships are certainly very different from the other. And reading about her life counsel, which she recommends that we should take on for ourselves, I couldn't help but think about what my life counsel would be like, which ones of my friends would be slotted into those 10 seats at the table, if you will. And what seats at the table does my life have that I need to add to my life council? I mean, one of them that instantly came up for me is the travel sports friend, right? If you have kids who play travel sports, you know, you get really, really close to those families because you spend so much time together. But then when you're not on that travel team or your travel team changes or your kids change and their interest changes, It's really hard to keep up with that level of friendship with those parents. And so it's like a shifting friendship over over time. So the Life Council just gives us so much to think about that says we have different kinds of friends for different reasons, and that's okay. And those different kinds of friends for different reasons can go up and down in friendship intensity over time, and that's okay too. So it's a book to help you just examine the status of your own friendships what you currently have, and then set an intention for what you want. If you're not happy with what you see in your life council, then you can set a goal for how to cultivate friendships in your own life. She's got a lot of explanation about friendship and a lot of conceptual ideas about what friendship is and could be, but then she puts these real life vignettes of her own friendships into the book. And you can see how those concepts come to life in her life, which means you can then see how they might come to life in your own. I love Laura Tremaine's voice. It felt like a friend was reading or writ- had written and was reading the book to me. It was very conversational. And she was actually kind enough to jump into our Get Literate Book Club meeting that we had on this. This was a choice um, last year in our book club for our Patreon community. And she hopped in and she answered all our questions and talked about adult friendships. And it just made me like the book even more than I did when I was just reading it 
on my own. So that's The Life Council by Laura Tremaine, a nonfiction book to kick off our ideas and our thinking about adult friendship. Now let's zoom in to a fiction book about friendship. I adored this next book that I am sharing with you. It was light, yet serious, hysterical, so funny, yet real and powerful. It had such the perfect balance of themes and things. The book I'm talking about next is The Garden of Small Beginnings by Abby Waxman. So it's all about Lily. Well, Lillian, and people call her Lily. And her husband passed away a couple of years ago. He died in a horrific car accident. And she has been trying to get her life back on track. She had a a mental breakdown. She spent some time um, away from her girls trying to get herself together. But she is back. And she is back with a vengeance. And she is getting a hang of this widow this widow thing, in her words. She's able to get herself up, go to work as a children's book illustrator, get her girls to school, have relationships with her sister. Like she's, she's doing the things. She's doing the things, but she's got some changes happening. And at work where she illustrates children's textbooks, she was asked, or I guess, told um, that she's going to be the main illustrator in this vegetable gardening book. The small press she works for is having trouble staying afloat, so they're branching out. And since she is their best illustrator, she's got the job for the vegetable gardening book. But in order to illustrate vegetable gardening, her job thinks you should be a vegetable gardener. And so they sign her up for a six-week class on gardening. And it's this class that changes her life. So it's on a Saturday morning, her sister comes, her girls come, and she meets this really unlikely cast of characters who are all there at the garden for their own very different reasons. And throughout those weeks, they clear the land, they each pick something to plant, they grow it, they weed it, And in the process of building the garden, they build relationships with each other. And they take their friendship out of the garden into the real world, helping each other plant their own gardens at home, and ultimately helping each other with the life events that come unexpectedly during this six-week time. I loved this book. I am not a gardener, but the the way the author discusses the gardening and in between each chapter there's a page um an informational page if you will and how to grow tomatoes how to grow corn how to grow strawberries how to grow turnips just these really fun facts in between the chapters about gardening that set the chapters apart and what i love is that these people were complete strangers But by the end of the seven, six weeks, they were just so wrapped up in each other's lives in such a beautiful, friendshipy kind of way. It's it's a book that, yes, the garden of small beginnings, but it had such big impact on the people were there. Now, the book is hysterical. The book is funny. This writing is funny. I read this book in a day and a half because I just... I couldn't let those characters go. I needed to know what happened to them. I was getting surprised by them at every turn. And I love seeing how Lily's life was changing as a result of letting these people in, letting herself have the time to cultivate, figuratively and literally, cultivate the friendships because of this garden. Such a beautiful, light, uplifting book about adult friendship. So that's The Garden of Small Beginnings by Abby Waxman. Now, the third book is much different. So I've given you a nonfiction book discussing the concept of friendship and adult friendship. Then I've given you a fiction book that is fun and light and funny and is going to invite you into those characters' hearts and make you want to have a group of friends like they have. And then this third book, is a memoir. 
this is an incredibly powerful memoir that just wrapped itself around my heart. It's called My Glory Was I Had Such Friends by Amy Silverstein. It is a touching, emotional, all-consuming memoir. So it's about Amy. And Amy, when she was in her early 20s, unfortunately had to have a heart transplant. Now, she was defying all of the odds. They told her, you'll probably have about 10 good years with this heart. And she was trying to enjoy life as much as she could while also maintaining the health of her transplanted heart. And she went past, she went much past those 10 years. But now at about 50, she suddenly, like truly suddenly finds that she needs a second heart transplant. And of course that means everything changes. She has to move from the East Coast to the West Coast where she can get better care. She's got to figure out how to wrap her head around going through this again with setback after setback after setback. But while this looks like, from what I'm saying now, a memoir about someone going through a second heart transplant, what it is is a celebration of friendships. When she was telling her friends what she was going through, every single one of them was, I got you. I'm there. And the book talks about nine truly remarkable women. Joy, Jill, Leha, Jody, Lauren, Robin, Valerie, Anne, and Jane. They all came together in a way that I have not quite seen. And this isn't fiction. This is real life. They had this spreadsheet central. And in order to keep someone with Amy 24 hours a day, to help her in this amazingly difficult thing that she was going through, they each signed up for multi-day shifts. Some of them flew across the country. All of them left jobs and families to come put in their rotation because their friendship was so strong. Now, the interesting thing is that their friendship was strong with Amy. Some of them didn't all know each other. Some of them did, some of them didn't. But in that spreadsheet and building that support system and passing the baton, so to speak, every couple of days in the hospital room, they became a stronger group together. It was unbelievable, this book. It literally had me catching my breath along with Amy. The writing is so descriptive. It is so beautiful that you're just there with Amy. You are feeling it as much as you can as a, a third party reader, what she is going through and how these women are there for her. Each chapter focuses on a different friend. Each friend supports Amy in a different way. And as Amy reflects on this incredibly selfless, wonderful thing her friends have done for her, she reflects on how and why their friendship came to be, how it helps her think about her own self as a friend and all of the connections that she's making between life and friendship and, and living a life well lived. The chapters are, they're beautiful in their writing, as I said, but what I love is that Amy talks about the here and now, but she also flashes back to when they first met and how the friendship began and then she also flashes to other parts of her friend's life where she was there for them. So it's this really beautiful back and forth. And I've got to tell you, I've never seen a friendship like this in real life or in fictional life. And the fact that this is a memoir, that it is real, that these women came to Amy when she needed it the most and that their friendship was able to stand the test of time like this. Oh my gosh, it was just so beautiful, so inspirational, and a book that, yes, will make you think about friendship, but it will also make you think about yourself, right? It is a book that will make you appreciate every single moment that your heart beats. 
and every single moment that you can take a breath. So it's more than a book on friendship. It is just a book on living, I guess, and and really thinking about what we have, what we might take for granted, what other people might be going through, how we can be a better friend. There's just so much beauty in this book. So this is the memoir, My Glory Was I Had Such Friends by Amy Silverstein. What of a trio, right? One nonfiction book, one fiction book that will just want you to dive into your friendships in real life. And then one that will make you think really hard and really carefully about the friends you do have, the kinds of friends you want to have, and how you want to live that life surrounded by them. It's just such a beautiful collection today. Now, if you want to think a little bit more about your own friendships Of course, I think reading these books are going to just, it's going to make you stop and think. It made me stop more times than I could count to think about the friends that I have and the kind of friend that I am and the kind of friend I know I could be, right? If I just take the time to do it. And I started off by saying I had so much more time when I was younger, but we didn't. It's the same 24 hours. It's just how we choose to spend them. And this book Well, actually, all three of these books made me think about that. So some of the things that I journaled about as I read these books and some of the journaling recommendations as I tinkered around Google um, for adult friendship statistics and information, some of those prompts ended up in my notebook. And so I wanted to share a couple of them with you. A couple of prompts to think about or just something to think about now as you're walking or driving or multitasking, who are your friends? If you had to sit down right now with a piece of paper and list out your life counsel, right? Just those friends that you think of when I say, who are your friends? Who are they? You might just jot them down, make a list. Who are your friends? Why are they your friend? What kind of friend are they? And how might you reach out to them right now? Right? If our happiness of our life is measured in relationships, then we probably should start spending more time on those relationships. And spending more time on them means we first have to figure out what they are. So just making that list of who are your friends and why, and what kind of friends are they, and how could you reconnect, that goes a long way. And maybe you like the list you see, and maybe you don't. Right. And back to Jim Rohn's quote, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. First of all, do you have five people on that list? Right. Remember, 53 percent of people studied only have one to four close friends. Right, That's me. I have one or two that I would say are really, really close friends. I have lots of other wonderful friendships, especially the virtual friendships I have created over time in this community. But if you don't even have five for the average of the five people you spend the most time with, you just have to ask yourself, how do you feel about that? I'm fine with having just one or two close friends because they are wonderful relationships. But maybe you want more. Maybe you are the kind of person that thrives on those relationships, but you find you don't have many of them to list down. That just means that you could do something about that. You might ask yourself, how am I as a friend? How do I act as a friend? Right? List some things down. Maybe you like it. Maybe you don't. Right? Just this week, I had reached out to a friend to have coffee next week, and she replied, and I forgot to reply back. Right? The text messages just went down and down and down in the list until I couldn't see it anymore. Right? I don't, I don't want to be that person. I don't want to be that person. So think about your own self, your own actions, and how are you as a friend? And then maybe you can make a list. What does a good friend mean to you? What does a good friend mean to you? Who are the friends around you that embody those characteristics? And then do you embody those characteristics? right? It goes both ways. And you might make a list of how you connect with people. Is it a quick text here and there? Is it an email? 
Is it a phone call? Do you get together in person? Do you get together on Zoom? How do you connect with those friendships and those other relationships in your life? How could you nurture them better? How could you nurture them more? Right? So just thinking about friendship, it really does bring up a whole host of questions about your own life. And that's why I brought you this particular set of books, because they're very different and made me think about friendship in very, very different ways. And then lastly, you just may make a list of three things you could do today to help you connect and or reconnect with friends, right? It could be that text. It could be a quick phone call. It could be stopping in. Remember, April, and I said remember, but now I can't remember if I talked about it here in this group. I think I did in my monthly Get Literate Love episode. April is letter writing month, letter and card writing month. So what a fun opportunity to go buy a set of small note cards and pick five of them or 10 of them and write a quick note to a friend. Getting that in the mail just feels so much different than getting that quick text message. So using the calendar might be a helpful way to reconnect with some of those friends that you haven't seen in a while. Either way, I hope that this episode just helps you think about your own adult friendships and gives you a little bit of permission to spend time thinking about them. Time for yourself, time for other people, Again, the number one predictor of happiness was the strengths of your relationships with others. And if that's how research, good Harvard research, shows that happiness is cultivated, then maybe we have to rethink all of the other ways that we're kind of conditioned to think that happiness comes to be. And it really does seem like it's that simple thing of just spending time with people that you enjoy and cultivating those friendships. So I hope that one of these books ends up on your TBR stack, whether it was the list of books that I talked about in the very beginning, those must reads about friendships that I have mentioned before, or these three books that I haven't brought to the podcast yet. The Life Council by Laura Tremaine, The Garden of Small Beginnings by Amy Waxman, and The Memoir my, the, my glory was I had such friends by Amy Silverstein. I hope that this episode got you thinking about friendships, has you thinking about a book that you could add to your TBR. And I hope it makes you want to go fill out a bookish snail mail book recommendation form. Remember, go to alitlife.com, click on the top on free literate love, scroll a little bit and you'll see the free bookish snail mail. You can take a look at my Google map to see where they've been sent so far. And apologies to those who I have sent cards to, but you don't see yourself on the map. I didn't have the idea for the map until just recently, once I realized I was sending postcards to different countries, which made me so happy. So if I've sent you a postcard and you don't see your pin, just send me a quick email and remind me and I will add you to it. The Google form takes less than a minute to complete and then I send it off in the mail. I've been getting a lot of submissions lately, which I love. And so it may take a week or two until yours arrives, but that's the beauty of the surprise. And you never know, these bookish snail mail postcards could help us cultivate some sort of virtual bookish friendship too. So thanks so much for listening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed this episode and I'll see you inside the next episode of the Get Literate Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Get Literate Podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes and at alitlife.com. Plus, if you want more, you might like to join my Patreon community. There, you'll find additional inspiration for your reading and writing life, like bonus podcast episodes, bibliotherapy book calendars, monthly book clubs, notebooking challenges, live events, giveaways, and much, much more. It's only $5 a month, and you get instant access to all of the previous content, too. You can learn more at getliterate.co. And one more thing. If you love what you listen to today, 
please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish and notebookish community too. Thanks for listening.